So let's give a warm pachyderm welcome to Mark Cars. Carl's really good at what he does, isn't he? It's good to know what you're good at, right? Stay in your perfect lane and life will, be, will go well for you. Um, I'm just going to kind of give you a brief overview of what the RNC does because there's a lot of misconception about what we do on the RNC, so I just want to clarify a little bit about that. Um, for most of you, it may be old hat, but... Uh, and then talk about what I care more about than anything on the RNC is all the litigation we're engaged in. And all of this really has happened since 2016. Um, and then talk about what it looks like nationally on the landscape, presidentially, U.S. Senate, U.S. House, governor races. And then just kind of a quick forward look, too, as well, as uh, hopefully uh, we have a, another white Republican in the White House. So... As a national committee man, I was elected in 16. I was just re-elected to my third term in January. So I'm your 23rd national committee man in the history of the RNC for Kansas. And uh, I think in seniority, there's 168 of us. Uh, I think I'm like 20th now in seniority on the RNC, which really doesn't give you much other than to say you've got seniority in that regard. <laughs> but. Uh, it gives you a lot of background and understanding of how the process works. So Mike Waltley is the current chairman. Uh, he's also chairman of North Carolina. He's a really gifted uh, political operative. He's done a great job at keeping North Carolina blue, which is very difficult because there's a lot of uh, Northeasterners that are moving into that state because of all the explosion of tech and so forth and medical uh, businesses as well. Um, I don't think he'll be our chairman, honestly, next year. He'll, I assume he'll go into the uh, Trump administration. Uh, that's what I understand. So we'll have another ch a new chair in January of next year, and assuming that Trump wins, which we are all assuming and hoping and praying, right? So the RNC, we have 168 members, 50 states, six territories. There's a committee man, woman, and chair for each of the 50 states and the six territories. And we are the board of directors, candidly, for this multi-billion dollar uh, company called the Republican National Committee. And we are chiefly uh, uh, assigned the tasks of running the Republican presidential primaries. When we have the White House, we are the largest, loudest cheerleader for the president. When we don't have the White House, we're the largest, loudest uh, detractor of the Democrat that holds the White House. And uh, we have many different committees, standing committees, uh, temporary committees. They all do various things. I, I, I'm on resolutions, and in fact, I'm hoping to chair resolutions. And that's not a committee I've really ever aspired to be on, um, because I've always thought resolutions can do more harm than help. But uh, if we are out of power, resolutions are a powerful way to state our position in opposition to the White House, to policy. If we're, the, if we're in power, it's an opportunity to uh, say, make statements in support of the White House and advance policy through uh, statements that the RNC issues. So I hope to chair that or that commit standing committee in January, and uh, we'll let you know if that turns out for me. I also chair a subcommittee on, on election integrity, which the whole election integrity committee was created in the aftermath of 2016. There's four subcommittees. Uh, my committee oversees uh, voting systems and technology. So we kind of do deep dives into the, to the voting systems in our, Amer in, in our politics and different technology issues that are related to voting. So as you can imagine, it's a very technically driven uh, committee, very hyper, uh, high level uh, understanding of, of how the voting systems work and operate. And we're always looking for ideas and ways to improve really to protect our ballot, to secure the ballot across the 50 states and six territories. So that's been a learning curve for many of us, but it's been a real honor. I served as chairman of the Elections Committee when I served in the State House for four years and uh, was able to advance some really meaningful legislation. The one that I, I'm most proudest of was the, uh, that I co-sponsored with uh, Senator Mitch Holmes, and that was turning our local elections from winter to summer and fall. So now we have elections every August and every November. We were not able to get those elections to make them partisan. That was one of the things we really tried to achieve, but we could not get that done with the uh, votes that we had in the House and the Senate. So 
as you all well know, we'll have local elections next year. Hopefully when we take back the governor's mansion, which I hope we do in Topeka and have a Republican majority in the House and Senate, we can make local elections partisan because it's just transparent. It's at, you know, people need to know where people stand on the issue. And uh, if someone's not associated or affiliated with the party, you have no idea where they are on the issues. And generally, if they're, if they're liberal and moderate, they tend to not share their op opinions. So uh, that's one of the goals I hope to, that our next governor will achieve. Um, so, so the RNC committee men, we know we're the, I'm the, I hope I'm the cheerleader. I try to be fair. I try to stay out of most primaries. I didn't stay out of my brother's primary. He ran for Congress in the third district, second district. No, couldn't stay neutral there. But it was a great opportunity for Jeff to run and um, see his campaign manager and his press secretary in, this, in the crowd. It was a joy working with that team. And, uh, but I, you know, in the general, I support every Republican. I, y you have to, right? You have to. I've not met a Democrat that I would prefer over a Republican. And as an RNC committee man, I feel obligated in, in, uh, to do that, and I'm proud to do that. So I um, try to support every Republican that's on the ballot in the general election, and, um, and that's what I will pledge to continue to do in my third term. Um, all right, just a quick bit on election integrity. Um, Since 2016, we've been advancing legislative proposals to the various 50 states. And we've had some success in, in legislation passed, mostly in red states, of course, um, since the uh, 2026, even 2020. And so I'm hopeful that cheating is harder in America than it was in 2016 and in 2020. There's certainly a lot more eyes on these ballots than there ever have been before. Uh, the red states have been cleaning up their voter rolls, and as a result, we have majority registration numbers in, many, in several states that we once before did not. And isn't that interesting? They clean up the voter rolls, and it's the Democrats that fall off, right? It's the illegals. It's those that are up there. They're on the roll multiple times. Um, I'm not saying that Republicans don't ever cheat. I, I, maybe some do, but uh, we don't have an art at it, that's for sure. Uh, enhanced post-election audits, which is incredibly important. Paper ballots have a distinctive moder watermark for every election after 2024 in Kansas. Prohibit counties from using voting equipment with any internet capability. It's my understanding that, n well, I, I can't verify any of this, but it's my understanding that none in Kansas do, and no one's proven otherwise. Uh, provide a re additional resources for county election officers. Outlaw ballot harvesting, that's my position. Um, but while it's legal, and it is legal in, in, in large red, blue states, we have to master that art. But I would love to outlaw it in Kansas and across the country. And that includes election drop boxes. I, we, we, and did you notice that some of these election drop boxes have been vandalized and attacked by the left? By the left, have been doing that. Um, how do we know who voted? If someone vote, drops their ballot in an election box and it's blown up, how, how do you replace that ballot? How do you know whose ballot it is? And there's no postmark on it. So when do we know those are dropped? And a lot of these aren't supervised. These drop boxes are relics from COVID and they need to be banned. And I strongly support eliminating them. And even, even if there's no nefarious mischief behavior going on around these ballot boxes, which we all assume and know there is, there is a large segment of, of, of voters in America that don't trust them. What's the advantage to having something in our electoral system where there are so many Americans don't trust them? There, I see no benefit to the ballot box. We have a mailbox, right? Go stuff it in the mailbox. I, so let's get rid of the stupid drop boxes. Um, we need to move towards paper ballots, which we have in Kansas. You vote electronically, it prints off a ballot, and make sure when you do that, you read the paper ballot, verify it prints off how you voted, and then we scan it into a box. Um, limit early voting and end ballot counting the day of the election. So I'm gonna talk a lot about that, but I, I really think we need to roll back early voting. That's gonna be a tough haul to make, especially now the Republicans are voting early. I think I voted early twice, once before, this is the earliest I've ever voted. Um, it used to be you voted on election day, 
And you got an advance ballot if you were on a disability list or if you were overseas military. And, you know, if you didn't show up to vote on election day, you just didn't vote. So I would advocate, I would even advocate for a holiday to make election day, election day. Uh, if you're overseas military, absolutely, we're going to mail you a ballot. If you're not able to get out because you're disabled, physically unable, absolutely, we'll mail you an absentee ballot. Otherwise, let's just have election day, election day. It ends on election day, and we know the, the results. They do it in Europe. They have paper ballots. They're counted, and the results are, are given the day of the election. And there's no election issues in Europe. Now, they have, you know, they're electing far left socialists, but uh, their politics are moving a little bit to the right. But um, they don't have this um, issue of election fraud like we've had over the last eight years. All right. I want to talk a little bit about protecting the ballot. We were in, the RNC is engaged in 100 pieces of litigation since the 2020 election. I think, we're, I think there's litigation in like 45 states. It's really, including our state. Um, we've retained election integrity directors uh, and legal counsel. And we, we're highlighting, we're, we're targeting, I should say, the, tar the swing states. There's seven swing states, you know, the same seven that we've had the last three election, presidential election cycles. Um, so we really are putting our emphasis on those states, but we're filing lawsuits across the country, and we're a lot of times we're the defendant because of, you know the Democrats are wanting, and I'll go through some of these. This is why Republicans rightly believe Democrats cheat and want to cheat. Uh, the issue in Virginia is a perfect example. Why would anybody want to keep illegals on the voting uh, list? Why? What would that be for? I, I'm just trying, why, huh? Why did the, Desert, Desert, the Desert Department of Justice file a lawsuit against the governor from Virginia? Why? I wonder why. Is it any wonder we don't trust the Democrats when it comes to voting? Um, Mississippi, though, I want to start with that because this is a proactive move that the RNC has been involved in. This is a huge case. And this has huge implications for voting early or voting late, rather. So we filed, we as in uh, the RNC and the Mississippi uh, Republican Party, and I'm going to read some of this. So let me just do that so I don't get this wrong. This case involves a challenge to a Mississippi statute, and about 25 states have this similar statute, that allows absentee ballots to be received up to five days after the federal election day. Now they have to be postmarked, you know, before the election, but they're counted five days afterwards. The plaintiffs, including the Republican National Committee and the Mississippi Republican Party, argued, argued that the state law conflicts with federal statutes that establish a uniform election day for federal elections. The plaintiffs sought to enjoin state officials from, in, from enforcing the post-election ballot deadline. The United States District Court for the Southern District of Mississippi consolidated two lawsuits and granted summary judgment in favor of the defendants, which included various state election officials. The district court held that the Mississippi statute did not conflict with federal law. We appealed. The United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Cir Circuit, and this is fairly recent ruling, reviewed the case and reversed the lower court's judgment. The Fifth Circuit held that the federal election day statutes preempt Mississippi's law because the federal law mandates that all ballots must be received by election day. The court emphasized that the term election includes both the casting and receipt of ballots and that the election is not consummated until all ballots are received. The court also noted that historical practices and other federal statutes support appropriate relief, considering the proximity to upcoming elections. This is now going to be uh, appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, of course. Um, if this is upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court, and I think it will be, um, every state that has a statute that allows absentee ballots to be counted post-election day will be invalidated. That means, that means that we will literally end elections on elections day, and we'll have that achieved, and then we'll have to work on the front end and try to narrow that as well. I, I just think early voting, I know it's convenient, I just think it, it leads to voter fraud and cheating, and it, just, and, and it weakens the, the, uh, the trust that Americans have in their electoral. 
We have to trust our law enforcement. We have to trust our Department of Justice. We have to trust our elections. And so I think adding these lengthy, uh, uh, these lengthy voting uh, times in front of the election day, I think is, 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 is more harmful than helpful. But so keep an eye out on that. That's a huge ruling for us in the uh, Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. It'll be heard by the Supreme Court next year. And I think, I think, we're, uh, I think we're in good legal standing to, to have that case uh, affirmed in the, in the Supreme Court. We're all familiar with the Virginia case, right? 1,600 or so illegals are on the ballots. They're self-identified illegals, self-identified non-citizens. The Virginia governor moved to have their names removed. Department of Justice filed an, an injunction. Uh, the Supreme Court just ruled six to three. Nope, you, got, you can continue to move, remove them from the voter rolls. Huge, huge, huge ruling. Pennsylvania, the RNC's asked the Supreme Court to block Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruling allowing voters to cast provisional ballots if their mail-in ballots are in error, lacking a signature, lacking a date, or what so. So that's, that is in, that's before the US Supreme Court right now. And if you all remember 2020, we had so many issues with the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Do you guys remember that? They were allowing ballots that had not been signed, it had not been dated. Um, and here we are all over again with the same Supreme Court of Pennsylvania and you know the the key the moment the, the key state in our in our election, right? Pennsylvania. I'll talk about that a little bit later. In Florida, I just want to read some of these lawsuits so you can just get a flavor for what the Democratic Party is all about and all of their third party uh, groups. Plaintiffs challenge Florida's law requiring wet signatures on voter registration application. So the left is opposing a Florida law that requires you to sign your own signature, wet signature means you signed it, literally, on a voter registration application, but the left doesn't want that. In Georgia, uh, there are so many lawsuits in Georgia, Fulton County. I'm just gonna give you one. Uh, the Fulton County Republican Party, Georgia Republican Party, the RNC, filed a lawsuit challenging Fulton County's failure to hire a sufficient number of Republican poll workers. They have a state law in Georgia, you have to have parity among poll workers in every precinct, and uh, they're not doing it, so we filed a lawsuit. Of course, it's opposed, right? It's opposed. Well, so we just, we just couldn't find enough Republicans in Georgia to, you know, to, poll, to, to man these polls. In Iowa, um, plaintiffs challenged provision of XYZ law, including provisions banning absentee ballot harvesting and drop boxes. So we're, you know, we are, they banned them in Iowa. Plaintiffs filed a lawsuit to undo that. So we're defending that law. We don't believe in ballot harvesting because it leads to cheating, right? Of course it does. And these ballot boxes, they're unsupervised. And we know that people are cheating, stuffing in them. Uh, they're being vandalized. We don't need them. In Michigan, uh, the RNC, Michigan GOP, filed a lawsuit challenging their secretary of, uh, uh, secretary of state, uh, unlawful guidance that purports to allow overseas citizens, this is brand new, who've never resided in Michigan, to cast ballots in the Michigan elections. So these are overseas Americans who are saying, I'm from Michigan. They've never lived in Michigan, but they're registering that they're from Michigan so they can vote in the Michigan election because that's a really important state in this presidential election. But the Democrats, they don't cheat, okay? It's a lie, they don't cheat. It's a, we make it up, it's all in our minds. These are, these are lawsuits filed in federal court. These are people trying to register in a state they've never lived in, and they don't live in there currently. Um, wow, I've got so many from Michigan. Um, here, we're suing the Secretary of State in Michigan because she's disregarding state law, which requires that serial numbers on absentee ballots match the serial number on the ballot envelope that it goes into and the poll books. Without that, there's no way to line them up and to verify that these absentee ballots are, are from the same person. Uh, I've, got a, I've got several from Michigan. I won't bore you with Michigan. So obviously, Michigan is a very important key state in this presidential election. And these are some of the things that the Democrats are opposing. They oppose election integrity laws. They do. 
across the country. Why? Why? Well, because you're suppressing the vote. No, we're not suppressing the vote. We want everybody to vote who's legally an American and registered to vote. Absolutely, that's what we want. We're not trying to deny anyone's right to vote. We just want it to be legal and fair. That's all we're asking for. That's what everyone should ask for. And by the way, um, I think like 85% of Americans want like voter IDs, but the left doesn't. So, all right. We've got several lawsuits against Governor Whitmer. Boy, it'll be nice when she's out of power. All right, New Hampshire, listen to this. Plaintiffs challenge Senate Bill 418, which requires voters registering on election day. Wow. I'm, I'm glad we don't have election day uh, registration. Requires voters who register on election day who do not provide acceptable ID to vote by a provisional ballot and submit proof of their identity otherwise. So they want people to go register and vote on election day that don't have a voter ID, and they want them to vote in the system. So once they vote, it's lost. You can't pull it back. So the law requires them to vote provisionally so we can verify that, yes, you are a legal citizen and your provisional vote will be counted. They're, they're, a, they're contesting that. Why would they contest that? I don't understand that. That doesn't make any sense. Unless you want to cheat, right? That's the only reason anyone would contest a common sense legislation like that. So this is, these are the things that the RNC spends a lot of money on. We have pretty good legal staff, but we outsource a lot of this to states, attorneys to, to handle that. Um, you know, we have one of the best attorney generals in the state, in the nation on election integrity when he was Secretary of State. Uh, he's a leader, even as Attorney General Chris Kobach has been a leader on, on these issues. Kansas is probably uh, one of the top five states on election integrity laws. There's more we could do. We need to get rid of the st stupid ballot boxes. Uh, we need to tighten up uh, uh, harvest ballot, ballot, ballot harvesting. Um, but overall, we have some of the strongest signature laws, signature laws in, this, in the country. And uh, we're really, a, I think, a, you know, a beacon when it comes to that. So kudos to our legislature. And <laughs> All right. Presidential map, presidential elections. Um, road to the White House. Okay, RNC, we had a Zoom hearing yes, meeting yesterday, we had a Zoom meeting, and we are forecasting a 287-251 electoral victory for Trump. That means that Trump would win Pennsylvania, Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina, losing Michigan and Wisconsin. I think that's about right. That's kind of where I am. Um, if Harris... Harris, if she does not sweep the Rust Belt, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and loses Pennsylvania, so she wins Michigan and Wisconsin, but she loses Pennsylvania, she then has to win Nevada and North Carolina. If she loses either Wisconsin or Michigan, but wins Pennsylvania, she only needs to win North Carolina. So, you know, Pennsylvania, you can win Pennsylvania and lose the election. You can lose Pennsylvania and win the election, but it's pretty darn hard. So Pennsylvania really is coming down again all to Pennsylvania, it looks like to me. Here's an interesting um, statistic. Since 1992, the three, ball, the three blue wall states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, 10, 20, 30, 39 electoral votes have all voted the same way every presidential election since 92. They've always voted, this, they've, they've just marched in the same direction, either Republican or Democrat. They've not gone their own way. I don't think they're gonna go their own way this way. There's a reason why, they're very demographically aligned, similarly aligned. Our registration numbers have improved in all of those three states. And that's why those three states in the Senate that are up for the Democrats are in play right now, and I'll go over that in a little bit. Um, as of today, Real Clear Politics has Trump leading in the national poll by 0.5%. Can Trump, that's, that's the national poll, all right, popular vote. What number was that, Mark? 0.5, half a percent. Oh, half. Yeah, it's, it's, it's narrow. Can Trump win the popular vote? Yes, Trump can win the popular vote. Is it likely? No. 
I don't think it's likely. Okay, yesterday, but he might, and it would be wonderful. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Yeah. I hope he does. Yesterday, for the first time, the RCP, Real Clear Politics, has the generic congressional ballot favoring the GOP. That's huge. And I'll mention a little bit later about the, the, the House is really what's up. I mean, the presidential race is a close race, but the House race for the majority is real close. Um, Nebraska Congressional District 2, Harris is leading by eight percentage points. That's Omaha. And that's important because Nebraska is not a winner-take-all state. Like Maine, they allocate their electoral votes by congressional district. Um, if Harris sweeps the Rust Belt built states, which is still a very big toss-up, but let's say Harris sweeps the Rust Belt states. She wins Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. But she loses the southern states, which looks very likely. North Carolina, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina. I feel very confident that we're going to carry those southern states. I'd be, I would be very surprised if we lose any of those. North Carolina makes me a little nervous, but... I think I feel very good about those states. Um, if she loses that Northeast 2nd Congressional District, which she's not leading, she's leading right now, so it's not likely, but if she loses that, the electoral vote will be 269 to 269. So there's a scenario, it's not likely, but there's a scenario where we end up with electoral tie. In that situation, um, the new Congress, each state, all 50, get one vote and uh, based on their delegation for the, for the presidency. And we, we, would, we control majority of the del state delegations. So Trump would win there, the, the Senate votes for the VEEP, and the Vance would win there. So if we end in a tie 269-269, we will prevail uh, when the new Congress takes office. Um, all right, let's go over the Senate. There's 30 seats up for election. Democrats have a 50-49-1 majority. Democrats uh, have 21 that they're defending, and which includes two independents, and we have 11. Is that right? 11 seats. So I guess there's 32 up. I meant 32. Of the, ni of the Democrats' 19 seats, 14 are considered solid Democrats, which includes the two independents. And that would be California, Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, um, Maine, Maryland, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Minnesota, New Jersey, New Mexico, uh, New York, Rhode Island, Vermont, uh, Virginia, and Washington State. Of the remaining seven Democrat seats, one is considered a strong GOP West Virginia, and one is lean GOP Montana. So Montana and West Virginia are flipping to the Republican side. So we're going to have a majority. So we will take back the Senate. There's no question about it. No one, nobody disputes that. The number, the que what's in dispute is how, how wide or broad our, our, our new majority will be. Um, of the 11 GOP seats, uh, eight are considered solid. Indiana, Missouri, Mississippi, North, North Dakota, Nebraska, Tennessee, and Utah. Uh, and then we're going to flip, of course, West Virginia and Montana. But of the three seats that we have, Florida is likely GOP, and uh, Texas is lean GOP. So you see, you see a lot, and then Nebraska. So Nebraska is an interesting state. They had, the, Democrats did, the, the Democrats did the same thing in Nebraska that they did to us several years back. Remember when Pat Roberts was running for his last re-election? Democrats didn't fill the candidate. They ran an independent. Independent. Well, that's what they did in Nebraska. They didn't run a Dem Democratic Party, did not run a Democrat. They ran a independent. He's independent. Uh, and there's no Democrat on the ballot. And that race has been surprisingly competitive. Uh, uh, Senator Fisher's in a, in a close, much closer race than she should be. But the latest polls show that she's going to win. So um, I predict a net pickup of six seats, West Virginia, Montana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. Those are all toss-ups. Those four are all toss-ups. But I think the trend has been trending with Trump, and I think it's been trending. Uh, all of those seats have been put into a toss-up mode. They were lean, they were lean, and then, uh, what's the next word less than tilt, and now they're toss-up. So I think things are trending in our direction. So there's three outlier states that, you know, we could win, Nevada, New Mexico, um, Maryland. Arizona. 
Arizona. Arizona, I'm sorry, Arizona. And, the, and our numbers are getting better in Arizona? Yeah, Arizona. I mean, so we, I think we're going to end up with 55 seats. We could end up with more. We have not had 55 seats uh, since 2005. That's the last time we control had a 10, had 10 vote lead. It's 2005, so it's been a long time. Um, I went back to see when, what, what's our record of, of seats held in the U.S. Senate. 1869. Was anybody here then? 1869? We held six. In 1869, we held 62 of the 74 Senate seats. That was during the Reconstruction era. The Democrats were not a very popular party then. Um, and then looking forward quickly, 2026 Senate map, it's, it, it's, it's a, it favors the Democrats. 32 seats are up for election. We're defending 19 of those 32 seats. Uh, Maine, Susan Collins, if she, runs again, if she doesn't run again, we'll lose that seat. If she runs again, it'll be a very competitive seat. Um, and then R Roger Marshall, our freshman, our junior senator, is up for his first election. First elections are always tough, even in a red state. Um, the Democrats are defending a seat in Georgia, Michigan, and New Hampshire, and those are all freshman Democrats. So, you know, if we end up 55 seat majority, I think we're in a good position, even if we lose one or two in 26. So, I'm hoping that President Trump will have a, will have a majority in the Senate during his last term as in the White House. Now, let's go to the Federal House. Uh, 218 is a majority. We have 221, slimmest majority in years. So when you all complain, or not you all, but anyone complains about our Speaker Johnson, I mean, he's got a majority of three in the federal house. Can you imagine managing a house like that? So it's tough. Not making excuses, but it's tough. Uh, Democrats have to net four to gain a majority. Um, so I looked at inside elections. I, like, I kind of track their information. I think they're pretty good. 182 Democratic seats are solid. 188 GOP seats are solid. There's 65 seats in play, sorta, not really. Um, there's 15 seats that are considered toss-ups, literally just, it's, it's, they're toss-ups. Um, eight of them are Democrats, Arkansas, California, Colorado. Um, Maryland, Michigan, two in Michigan, Virginia and West Virginia. And then there's seven GOP seats that are considered toss-up. Two in California, two in Iowa, which is a little surprising, two in New York, and in Oregon. Um, I, I, the prognosis that the inside, inside elections gives is a range of plus six Republican, plus eight, or plus nine Democrat. I was at an event with Ron Estes earlier in the week, and he he saw the, the swing, plus two de Republican, plus two or three Democrat, but the Republicans maintain control of the House, and I think that's what will end up happening. I don't think, I think, I think we'll add, my, my guess is I'm going to, I think we're going to do a little bit better in the House than some, some suggest. I'm, I think we're going to have, uh, pick up 10 seats, which will give Johnson a little bit more room to work. Uh, and he's a strong supporter of Trump and will follow Trump's lead on legislative, uh, his legislative agenda. And I think he'll do a great job. So, um, but the political report just sent out a, a report just about a half an hour ago. And final house ratings, the majority is still on a knife's edge. So they have it at, literally at a flip of the coin. So that's, we won't know who, who the majority uh, party is in the, probably in the federal house until several days after the election. Governor's mansions, there's 27 governors. We have, 20, GOP controls 27 governors. The, the Democrats control the other 23. We have only 11 seats. Governor mansions up in 2024. Six of them are GOP man, mansions. They're solid GOP. One Democratic mansion is considered solid. One GOP mansion in New Hampshire is a toss up. Um, I'm trying to remember the lady that's running for that. Uh, yeah, Kelly Ayat. She's former U.S. former uh, senator, right, uh, or congresswoman. She's leading, and I think she's going to hold that seat. So that's that's great. So that's a hold. It's not a pickup. And the Democrats 
uh, likely going to hold on to North Carolina and West and Washington. Washington's an impossible state right now, at least to take back the governor's mansion. And we just are the lieutenant governor in West in um, in North Carolina just has imploded and uh, is dragging the party down candidly. So net zero for the governor's races. No one's going to pick up. No one's going to lose. All right, Kansas politics, as everyone knows, all of our senators and House members are up. And uh, we're going to have a robust gubernatorial primary in 2026. And, we, you know, honestly, we need one. Primaries are important. You know, Harris would have benefited from primaries. She would have never gotten out of it. But when you don't have a primary in your own party, unless it's re-election, you're, you're just you're not as good as a candidate at all. I think Derek Schmidt will be a better candidate because he had a robust primary. I think it's important for us to have a primary in our gubernatorial race. We didn't have one last time. And we didn't win that race. And then Marshall has to defend his seat. And he's been a really great uh, junior senator. And uh, I don't think he'll, I, I think he's gonna do fine defending that seat. We have no idea who the Democrats are gonna run. Um, I think if the governor ran for that seat, that would be a very competitive seat. Um, I think they could spend millions of dollars on that race. I don't think she's going to run again. She does, I haven't seen signs or indications that she's moving to the center other than her rhetoric. So I don't, I don't see her doing that. All right, so this is what the Democrats will do if they ever take back the country in this, by means of holding the White House and the House and the, and the Senate. Uh, and H.R. 1, which was the nationalization of our elections, it passed the House, never got anywhere in the Senate, thankfully literally nationalize all elections, and we would have one party rule. Get rid of the Senate filibuster, they've said they would. Stack, and so they'd stack the US Supreme Court, and they can do that statutorily, it's not a constitutional amendment. I think they'd add six, some say three, and they'd add six of the like that they have now, so we'd have nine progressives on the Supreme Court. And they also would require mandatory senior status, so they would invalidate all of our constitutional rights. I mean, there would not be a First Amendment, there would not be a Second Amendment, there, not, there would not be a Third Amendment, gun rights would be gone, free speech would be gone. I, it would be ugly, one party rule. We'd be in civil war. What? We'd be in civil war. It would be ugly. Uh, they would give statehood to DC and Puerto Rico, which gives them four permanent US senators, forever. They'd give citizenship to every illegal in America. And that's why majority of Americans support the president in deporting illegals. Because if they're not deported, whenever the Democrats take back all levers of, of power, they will give them citizenship. We're not against legal migration. We support it. Obviously, we're a nation of immigrants. But it's got to be done legally. We have to know who's coming into our country. We have to defend our borders, right? And that's just common sense. Someone can't just walk into your front door and take up a bedroom upstairs, right? Democrats think that's fine. Uh, they'd forgive all college debt. We'd have stag inflation like Argentina. They'd, they'd destroy our domestic production of oil and natural gas. They'd mandate the elimination of the, the engine, combustion engine, right? more and less wars, and they'd weaken or sever our support of the state of Israel. There's no question about it. That's the newest thing that's happened, really, with their party, uh, as far as being public and open about it. And you can see the shift. You can see it in the world. There's a shift. I mean, Israel's Jews have suffered their entire existence on this earth. Uh, but Israel, you could see a shift in America for the first time. The Democratic Party really no longer, I mean, Biden supported them to some extent, but um, there's no question if Harris was the, white, was the president, support for Israel would weaken dramatically. And, uh, but by God's grace, they, you know, they exist as a nation today. And then I'll just end up just saying the state party does a lot of work, um, and there's a way to support the party called the 1776 Program. And that's the donation monthly. I'm a supporter. It just, over, it just funds the day-to-day -day operations. And uh, I recommend that, you know, it's important to have a state party. And uh, everyone volunteers their time. I volunteer my time. Uh, we love the party. Uh, we love politics, of course. That's why we're all here. We love this nation. 
Uh, I've got a newsletter if you ever want to get it, uh, mark at carsforkansas.com. And I generally send them out after our RNC meetings. We generally have two or three a year. So we'll have one in January, hopefully in DC, because we'll be there for the inauguration, right? Is that right? Hope you can make it. And, uh, and I always like to say that it's an honor and a privilege to be part of the Kansas RNC team representing our Kansas conservative values. And Cedric County has had this position, or someone from Cedric County, for a long time. Todd T. Hart, I guess Mike Pompeo preceded me, and then Congressman T. Hart preceded him, and Jack Ranson preceded, there's a couple in between there, but we've got a traditional of sending the, uh, of, of RNC men from Cedric County, and it's a good tradition. Because um, let's face it, we're the center of the universe when it comes to Republican Kansas politics. Right here. Right here. We have the speaker. We have the president. Maybe we'll have a governor from here someday. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, all right. In closing, you know, this, th this is why I'm in politics. I think many of you are in politics for the same reason. Um, but all we can do is place our faith in Christ Jesus and his providence in all things. That's all we can do. We pray. We, we hope God's will is for Trump to win on Tuesday. Um, I hope it is. I believe it is. Um, um, but we have to just rely on him. And um, he offers atonement. That's why we're here. He offers atonement for our sin through his, his, his death in, on, the, on the cross and his resurrection. And, um, and he says, if you repent and confess your sins and turn away from your sins, and follow him daily. He will come and reside in you with the Holy Spirit. And so I urge you to do that. There are a lot of believers that are here that would love to share our faith with Christ with you. I'm happy to do that. But that's all that really matters at the end of the day. Because we're just here as a vapor. And then we die and we stand before the Lord. And uh, you want Christ's atonement and uh, shielding you from God's wrath. There's no question about it. Plus the joy that he gives you on earth and the fellowship among believers. Um, but we, you know, we're all Americans and uh, we, we need a little bit more civility in our politics, quite candidly. Um, it's, that's not sacrificing our positions or our values, never. But um, I think it would be helpful to see more of it. And uh, I think that would be a good, a good thing in our, in, our, in our country. So get out to vote. Looks like you've all already voted. I voted early, too. I don't like voting early. I hope we haven't cannibalized our Election Day voting. I don't think we have. It'd be nice to know who's voting early. I hope it's, I'm, we're all voters that vote every election. So clearly, Election Day voters have been voting early. And that's good, because sometimes things happen on Election Day, and you can't vote, right? And can you imagine missing this vote? So, Really important election. So I guess I have time to answer questions if I do. I don't know if I do or not. Thank you. How are you, brother? Good to see you. So we like to have our Packer member ask questions first. Be sure to keep it to a short question because we've just got a little bit of time. So I'll get as many as I can. We'll start right here and we'll move there. Yeah, it seems to me we're always dancing to the Democrats. If we win, all three of the uh, divisions of government. Why don't we take Washington, D.C. off the chart of being a state? You know, let the representation go to Maryland, like we did with Virginia. I support that, but I think it's a good point. And, and, uh, but the problem is that we have a filibuster. And we're not, the Republicans are not going to get rid of the filibuster. Once we get rid of the filibuster, the Senate is not the Senate. And so... We don't have 60 votes to get that passed. We just don't. Now, if we win Nevada and New Mexico and Virginia, we win those Senate seats and the other, the other swing states in the, in the Rust Belt and throw Maryland in there for good measure. We know we have Montana and West Virginia. That gets us close to 60, and we can get a lot done with 60 senators, a lot done. So, but that's probably why we won't get that done. Yes? Who did Senator uh, Ted Cruz, Texas, take off? He's on Fox every night trying to get campaign funds because he says the RNC didn't give him money 
2020. Not the RNC. Not the RNC. Okay. The, the, RNC doesn't give money. Okay. Whoever gives the, it all, Senate it. McConnell is not giving him money. Okay. Wow. Wow. It's a big surprise, right? Yeah. McConnell has not given him any money from his leadership fund. And he's got like a quarter of a billion dollars in it. Question back there? Yes. Hey, Mark. Hey there. You are against, you know, voting early in the ballot boxes and all those things that a lot of us, what we the people are against. What can you do or what can we do to kind of help uh, change those things? Uh, well, we need to get a governor that's a Republican, first of all. We have a narrow supermajority in the House. We have one in the Senate. I hope we retain them after Tuesday. But candidly, until we get a Republican governor that really believes in election reform, it's hard to get that stuff done. And even when, even when Sam was in the, in the governor's office, Governor Brownback, um, those issues weren't really swirling around. Uh, we didn't have these idiot ballot boxes. But, um, you know, we, there was some movement towards trying to bring back election day to election day, right? Election day, not election month. Um, but there is not, I don't know if there's unanimity in the Republican Party right now on, on some of these issues. I do think there is on ballot boxes, certainly on voter integrity laws like signature, uh, limiting absentee ballots. I, I, I strongly support limiting absentee ballots to people who are disabled or out of sea or overseas in the military only. I really do. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to get up and walk or take your bike or drive your car to an early voting location to vote in person. Otherwise, I don't think absentee ballots should be allowed otherwise, personally. It just, it's just ripe for, for uh, fraud. Yes? Thanks, Mark. Uh, on, on the balloting by mail, with absentees and so forth, it appears in the past that the uh, postal department has had a problem getting those delivered on time. Do you know anything about that? Or I've heard controversy about no, I've heard that. Um, it, uh, you know, it, I mean, it's a federally run program. What do you want? But if, if you want your ballot to count, go and vote in person. I'm, I just, can we not? I mean, this is democracy. We're trying to defend democracy. If you're, you, there, uh, it's, the, it's the distribution centers, I heard. So here in Wichita, our distribution center for the, for the, uh, the Postal Service is here. But if you go to, like, Dodge City, and I want to mail, if you, if you want to mail a letter across the street to your neighbor, um, it, what you do is you go to the mailbox, the distribution for out that area goes down to Texas, then it comes back up to Dodge City and finally goes into the mailbox. So it's depending on where the distribution centers are for, for what location. Well, I think next year the Supreme Court will outlaw any ballot counted if it's not received by election day. So if you want your vote to count, you know, walk, run, jog, drive, bike, skateboard, you know, to the polling booth and vote like we used to. Remember? We used to. All right. Yes, sir. What would be your perspective on having someone after Trump is elected, like Elon Musk, come in as the next president who we know can reduce the size of government as he did with Twitter? As president of the United States? Yeah, I don't think he was born in America. I don't think, well, I, I, I mean, in some regard, I, I think he's, he's going to be very helpful in Trump's administration. But there are a lot of things that I don't agree with him on some, on some issues. So um, I, I think we have a lot of great governors out there, Vice President Vance, uh, J.D. Vance, um, the governor DeSantis. Um, I think we'll have our share of qualified conservatives to carry the, the Trump mantle forward. Yeah, I think he'll be very helpful in that, in that, in that regard. But let's face it, I mean, Repub let's be on can we just be honest? Yeah. Republicans don't want to cut spending. Do you see any of them advocating for it? We had a, we did send, really the last one that really spoke about it elegantly and forcefully was the senator from Oklahoma, uh, who what was his name? No, no, the other, anyway, there's not an appetite to cut spending 
in the federal government. I don't see it on either side of the aisle. Um, we hear about it, but you know, you don't really see it. So I hope that this president and uh, this new House and new con federal Senate will advocate for cutting. We need to cut the, go the government. We have to. We're, we have $35 trillion in debt today. Yes, sir. I read last night that Harris has cut $2 million out of North Carolina, so that's good news. Yeah, that is good news. And uh, in the 50s, we had a lot of, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Congress did a lot of uh, un-American activity uh, uh, investigations. Is there any chance the Democratic Party could be declared un-American and be uh, eliminated? <laughs> Well, I mean, they just pop. You know, they're like a, they're like weeds. They just pop up under another name. Uh, so, I, I just think we have to get our positions in our, which are popular and majority. I think majority still held in this nation. We just need to get out there and and uh, and beat them at the ballot box. Thank you. Hey, Appreciate it. Thank you, and thank you, Donna. Thank you very much. Appreciate that.